I'd like to present our, our speaker today, Rocky Blyer. Rocky was born in Appleton, Wisconsin in 1946 and attended Appletown Xavier High School where he learned hard lessons and succeeded to become a college football scholarship player. Rocky successfully played football, becoming the starting halfback for the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. Rocky graduated from Notre Dame in 1968. Rocky's toughness caught the eye of the Pittsburgh Steelers, and he was drafted in 1968 at the pick 4, 417 in the 16th round. Despite his low draft position, Rocky was determined to show all that he could make it. Rocky comp compensated for his lack of size and speed with grit, determination, and made the Steeler team in 1968. His career in pro football was cut short before the Steelers season ended in 1968 by a second draft in the United States Army. <clears throat> Rocky entered the U.S. Army in 1968 as a specialist, Company C, 4th Battalion, 31st Infantry Regiment, 196th Infantry Brigade. He was posted to the Republic of Vietnam where he was badly wounded. When his platoon was ambushed and received wounds from both grenade and rifle fire in his lower right leg. It took a long time before he was barely able to walk and his stiller career seemed over when the doctors told him he would never play football again. While recovering in a Japanese hospital he received a mailing from Art Rooney, the Steelers owner. It read, Rock, the team's not doing well. We need you. Rock was now so inspired that Mr. Rooney would take the time to write and show interest in him. Mr. Rooney and the Steelers took a special place in his heart. Mr. Rooney lit the fire in Rocky that drove him in determination that to prove the doctors wrong. Rocky was discharged from the U.S. Army in 1970 with a bronze star, purple heart, and a coveted combat infantry badge. Determined to return to the game he loved, with sheer courage, determination, and drive, Rocky overcame all his obstacles and fought his way back. And after informal workouts with the Steelers in 1970, these informal workouts led to his winning the starting halfback position on arguably the best professional football team ever assembled, the Pittsburgh Steelers of the 1970s that won four Super Bowls. An example for all, Rocky the veteran has become a role model an icon in Pittsburgh for all especially suffering from adversities. Please join in me in welcoming The Rock, Rocky Blyer. Thanks. Hey Herb, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. and. Uh, Indeed, it's a pleasure for me to be able to be here, be a part of this closing ceremony uh, on, uh, uh, on this wall that uh, has come here to Butler. To um, all the gold mothers that are here, to family, to uh, veterans, um, and to you ladies and gentlemen for being a part of this, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to be able to join you for um, what I think is one of the greatest memorials that we have uh, in this country, and that's the Vietnam Veteran Memorial, and the traveling wall that we see here. You know, part of the story I was, I was, I was gonna relate to that Herb had made mention was that fact that 
Um, a postcard that I had uh, received from Mr. Rooney at times of need when things weren't going well. Uh, and, uh, you know, two simple sentences, the team needs you, um, you know, and we, and we need you back. Um, I thought was a, was a great gesture on the part because what it really created was a sense of hope and an opportunity that somebody cared about you as a person. Um, and that opportunity becomes very important. So we live in a country of that, of opportunities, be able to move forward, but more importantly, in the creation of hope. What goes on over the past three, four days here, and especially with this wall, is just that simple thought that what we've created in our society is a sense of hope. Those names that are etched on that wall are simply that, a sense of hope for the future. Loved ones that we have lost, friends that have departed, have all become a part of us. In 2012, and I say this, in 2012, the Department of Defense established a committee to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War, which will go until 2025. But it was really the Vietnam War period established by the Department of Defense for those who had served our country from 1955 to 1975. 55 was the first time that we had sent advisors to Vietnam. 75, obviously, when we withdrew. But during that period of time, nine million men and women served in that period, of which today, seven million are still alive. Now, it was established to be able to thank the American people for their commitment and their sacrifice, to be able to thank our allies for the support, to be able to thank and not forget the POWs and the MIAs, but more importantly, to be able to thank you as Vietnam veterans for the service that you've given to this country. Now, the Vietnam veteran era was really established from 1961 to 1975, in which 3.5 million of us served during that period of time. And it's really thanking you, the families, for what we have sacrificed during that war and what we have today. This wall, as I had made mention, is our memorial. And it didn't come easy. It took Jan Scruggs eight years to be able to raise the money to fight Congress, to find a spot, to be able to bring to the public the need of a memorial for our veterans and for that war. But like the war, it wasn't popular, this memorial. It was called the big black gash of shame, if you may recall. It was designed by a person of Asian descent, Maya Lin, controversy but yet it has become one of the most popular memorials in Washington, D.C. And it's become a wall of healing for those who've lost loved ones and a remembrance for us of what took place during that period of time. Those we fought with, those friends, those we went to high school with, those family members that gave their ultimate sacrifice in their lives to a war that was not popular, to 
to a war that left a lot of us and a piece of us back in Vietnam. But it is our war, wall, and it's a wall, as I said, of healing. I can remember the first time that I was in D.C. and I had taken my kids all those many years ago, right after it was opened, to visit that wall. And it was really amazing transition for those who've ever had that, who've had the experience of going there, because it was a hot summer day in June, July, as I recall. Oh, and the kids were tired and were dragging, we saw all the memorials, and they didn't want to walk anymore, and when can we go back to the hotel, and can I get some ice cream, can I do all this, and they're whining and crying, and, and we came to the top of the wall, and people were all over, and I was somewhat embarrassed because I had these brats, <laughs> you know, that weren't, didn't appreciate of what we had gone through. And so I said, no, we gotta go and we gotta walk. Now they didn't have a sense of what this wall was, except that it was a memorial and dad had fought in Vietnam. And so as we started to go down the walk, and as we got towards the middle, all of a sudden there was this silence. No one told them to be quiet, no one told them to mind their own business, but all of a sudden it was the power of that wall of what took place that they were somewhat changed in awe of what had taken place. Because it's a constant reminder if you see every name <coughs> that is on that wall. It's a personal reminder of the sacrifice that had taken place. Just not a monument, but really a personal touch of what we lost during that period of time. But it's ours. For you see, each and every one of those 58,000 417 names that are on that wall are one of us, really, are really one of us, you and me. But as we had left that war and came back, we all came back injured, whether it be physically, emotionally, and we have our wounds in which we have to heal. And ultimately, when it was over, those four or five years after I was there, you know, and I thought about myself, we would never do this again, would we? I mean, we, as an American people, we'd never do this again. Maybe that was our mission as Vietnam veterans, to stop this kind of insanity. I mean, the 58,000 Americans that had died, 58,000, like each and every one of us but unluckier by an inch, half inch, a millimeter of breath, 58,000 would die. And so many more that were injured and continue to be injured from that war. We wouldn't do that again. But lessons we have not learned. But it's a reminder for us and as I pay tribute to these names that are on this wall as we are here, because it's really all of us. So, as a Vietnam veteran, in serving our country, you know, we have come, if you think about it, from the four corners of this great land, from the north and the south and the east and the west, and we're dispersed to I-2, 3, and 4 Corps, from the DMZ to the Delta, from Cambodia and Thailand to the coastal shore. And we wore the patches of the Americal, the 25th, the Big Red One, the 82nd, 101st, representing the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. We were private, non-coms, and officers. We walked point, humped the monkey on our back, and bitched about the food. 
Now we worked the big guns, the mortars and the M60s, and flew support and fighters and gunships and C-130s. We would patrol not only the rivers of the Mekong, but also the streets of Saigon and Long Bend and Da Nang and Chu Lai, and we belonged to the MPs and S&Ts and intelligence, and we were in finance, communication, and personnel. We cared for the wounded and sent the dead home in body bags. In that era, as I said before, we were 3.5 million strong. Now we laughed, we cried, and we were afraid to die. We lost family, friends, and loved ones. We were bored, waited for care packages, and sent love letters home. We look forward to R&R &R rotation and becoming civilians once again. Now we left one battlefield only to face another, and we fought for our dignity. And we went back to making a living. And we became writers, and doctors, and lawyers, and musicians. We went back to the farmlands and the factories, and we worked our way up the corporate ladder, became elected officials. We married, or remained single, and we got separated, or divorced, but we raised our families, and we moved on. Our experience us. We either copped out, or we coped. And for those who survived, we worked hard and made it. And now that we have come of age, we're the ones who feed this nation and care for the sick, and we're the ones who own the factories and make the country's decisions, and we pay the price. So be proud, not only as Americans, but also as Vietnam veterans, because we deserve it. You did good. God bless. And enjoy.